from the mercy of Allah upon us and the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his servants, Allah azza wa jal gave us signs, signs in which they'll occur and emerge before the day of judgment. And Hudayfa ibn Yamani says, while we are sitting down in one of the gatherings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he asks us, what are you discussing? What are you talking about? So they said, oh messenger of Allah, we are talking about the day of judgment. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he says, well the day of judgment will not emerge. The day of judgment will not occur until you see 10 major signs. And amongst those 10 major signs is what the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam speaks in this hadith until you experience the Dajjal Antichrist, Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, the return of Isa, Jesus, the son of Mary, Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, Gog and Magog. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam speaks about the Dukhan, the smoke, and then the beast. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam says about, and speaks about the sun rising from the west. And then he says alayhi salatu wa salam, three landslides, one in the east, one in the west, one in the Arabian Peninsula. And then the last one that will occur is a fire that will come out in Aden, Yemen, that will force people to the place of assembly before the day of resurrection. Ten major signs. Ten major signs which are connected to one another. As the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says in another hadith, that are like beads in a string or a necklace. If you cut it, all the beads will start falling one after the other. And that's how the ten major signs will occur. The moment one of them will occur, then the others and the other ones will follow. And we don't know the order and the sequence of those ten major signs beside three. That the Dajjal will occur and after that, Al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam, the return of Isa ibn Maryam. Then after Isa ibn Maryam, it will be the advent and the appearance of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, Gog and Magog. The Prophet ﷺ tells us also in Muslim that any one of these signs, if they appear, there is no more repentance. There is no more repentance. You can't make tawbah anymore. The rising of the sun from where it sets. The Dajjal when he arrives. And Isa ibn Maryam when he descends. And also, there is another hadith about the fourth one, Adab. There's a beast that comes out of the earth. There is no more repentance. You can't make tawbah anymore. Life will become difficult towards the end. Challenges will come. Disasters will come. Catastrophes will come. The earth will be covered in injustice and in wars and in battles. And you see that today. Look at the Arab Spring. Look at Syria. Look at Africa. Look at what's happening there in Russia. Mankind is becoming more and more unstable and unhappy and miserable and in difficulty and in turmoil. And when the earth is covered with injustice as it is going towards that direction, the Prophet ﷺ gives us the glad tidings of a righteous ruler who will come. Now about this righteous ruler, the Prophet ﷺ says he will fill the earth up with justice and peace as it was filled with oppression and wrong. Good days will come after these difficulties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to lift this ummah from its absolute misery and feeble state that it is now. He's going to lift it back up to its victorious honorable state, back to its nobleness that it once carried, this ummah. From once being united to our disunity today, it will return back to the unity. It's going to return back to its glory. It will become the leading nation of the world in every sense of the word as it once was before and even better. And with regards to this ruler, a thousand and fifty ahadith have been narrated, of which four are sahih. The Prophet wasallam at his time, one day he came at Dhuhr to the masjid and started to speak about the signs of the end. That this is what will happen and this is what will And he wasallam spoke from Dhuhr until Asr. And then they gave the Adhan for Asr. They stood up, they prayed. The Prophet wasallam stood back up and started to speak again from Asr until Maghrib. And in that way he continued and the Ashab say he mentioned and went through every sign and we remembered what we could remember and forgot what we forgot. So amidst those signs that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, he mentions this hadith. And I want you to listen to it carefully. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, تَكُونُ النُّبُوَّةُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونَ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَن يَرْفَعَهَا 
prophethood will stay amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izza wishes for it to remain then Allah Rabbul Izza will lift up prophethood and prophethood would be no more and me and you are witnesses that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away prophethood was lifted and prophethood is no more so Ya Rasul what will happen after prophethood so he said ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةً رَاشِدًا فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ تَكُونُ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْ يَرْفَعَهَا Then will come the age of the rightly guided khulafa, the rightly guided khalifas of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They will reign amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes for them to reign. Then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift up the reign of the rightly guided. Ya Rasul, what will come after them? ثُمَّ تَكُونُ مُلْكًا عَادًّا فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ تَكُونُ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْ يَرْفَعَهَا Then will come an age where rulership and leadership is passed within tribes as in it will become tribal or it will become legacy and lineage based. This king, the son of this king, one will handball it to the one after them. فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونُ Then this age will stay amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes for it to stay. Then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift this age up from amidst you. ثُمَّ تَكُونُ مُلْكًا جَبْرِيًّا Then will come a tyrannical rule, an oppressive rule. And it will last amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izzah wishes it to last. ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْ يَرْفَعَهَا Then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift up this age when he Azza wa Jal wishes to remove that age. Then what will come after this age of tyranny and oppression? Listen, O Muslims, and glad tidings to you. ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةً عَلَى مِنْهَاجِ النُّبُوَّةِ Then will come the age of the rightly guided Khalif who will lead in accordance to the teachings of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And with regards to him, he is famous amidst us as the Mahdi. Literally in Arabic, Al-Mahdi means in English, the awaited one and the anointed one. So the chosen awaited one. And the Mahdi, some scholars say he's born now and others they say not yet. The minor signs make it a possibility that he probably is right now here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The Rasul says, Al-Mahdi min itrati min waladi Fatima. The Mahdi is from my lineage. As in from my progeny, from the children of Fatima. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, his name will be my name. So his name will be Muhammad. And his father's name will be my father's name. So he will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And as the earth was filled with wrong and oppression, he will fill it with justice and peace. So the age of the Mahdi is an age of intense struggle. And the hadith says he will stay with you for seven years and maybe eight. And if it really extends nine years. And this righteous ruler, Ali radiallahu anhu says, Al-Mahdi minna ahl al-bayt. The Mahdi is from us, from the family of the Prophet. Yuslihuhu Allahu fi layla. Allah Rabbul Izzah will prepare him for the office of leadership in one night. So the Mahdi doesn't know he is the Mahdi. And the Mahdi doesn't have the competencies of the Mahdi. Until one night, in one night Allah will transform him. The ahadith mention that a king will die in the Jazeera, in the Arab Peninsula. And the sons or three sons of a king will fight and quarrel over leadership. And to avoid this quarrel, this man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, will leave Medina in secret and go to Mecca. Because he doesn't want to be involved in the conflict, nor does he want people to turn towards him. So when he goes to Mecca, his aim is to avoid getting tangled up in this leadership struggle. Yet people follow him from Medina into Mecca. And they find him and they take him out. And they bring him to the Kaaba. And there, between the, the Rukn, as in Hajr al Aswad, and Maqam Ibrahim, they will make bay'ah to him when he doesn't want it. And as soon as they have pledged allegiance, two things will happen. Number one, an army will march out from Syria to attack this progeny of the Rasul. 
And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen carefully, is in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, and he is asleep. And in his sleep, he starts to move. He looks uncomfortable. He's displaying what he's never displayed before. Discomfort and sleep to the extent that he's moving. Then he got up. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have seen you do what you normally do not do. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Strange is the situation. An army will come from Syria, intending the house of Allah, from my ummah, seeking a man from my progeny to attack him. So the first people in Mahdi will fight are Arabs who are under the banner of Islam, but they've erred, gone wrong. They will hear about the Mahdi and they will not agree with him. They, they, they'll say he is not the real one. And they will come from an eastern direction of Mecca. They'll come in with an army to fight Al-Mahdi. An army will come campaigning towards the Kaaba until it reached the Bayda. And Bayda is an expanse of land between Mecca and Medina, flat desert land. When it reaches there, the Prophet says, wa The earth will suck them in there first and their last. And in another call, one person or a couple of people will be left just to tell the tale. So this is one of the signs that this one is the one the Prophet ﷺ intended. First, that his name will be my name, and his na the name of his father will be my father's name. Second, an army will come to attack him, and he will be unarmed, and the army will be destroyed by Allah alone. So when this happens, realize that this is the one. And the people that realize it, Initially, or the first batch that go towards him is from our lands, from Khurasan. The black flags will rise from the areas of Afghanistan. And the flags will come towards him. And they will traverse through the land until they come in help of the Mahdi. And his time is a difficult era. The Rasul says it in an eloquence befitting the majesty of the Rasul. Listen carefully, Muslims. تَخْزُونَ جَزِيرَةَ الْعَرَبِ Allah. You will campaign in the Arab Peninsula and Allah will open it. Prophet ﷺ said he will fight offsprings of two Khalifas. Now we've had many Khalifas in the past. We've had the Ottoman Empire, we've had the Abbasi, the Fatimi, we've had the Umawi Khilafah, we have many different. And when he says the offsprings, meaning of them, Allahu Alam, which ones exactly? But the first ones are Arabs. And Allahu Alam, they could be of the Abbasi or the Umawi ones. And he said he will wipe them off. And the companions asked, O Messenger of Allah, what if among those Muslims who fight him are proper Muslims, but they've just erred and they die within that battle like that? What's going to happen to them? Rasul Sallallahu said, every one of them will be gathered on a day of judgment on the intentions they died for, on the intentions they died for, even if they were the wrong army. Then there will be a campaign against the Persians. فَيَفْتَحُ Allah, And Allah will open it. Persia those days, today is known as Iran. ثُمَّ تَغْزُونَ الرُّومِ Then there will be a campaign against Rome and Allah will open it. He called it Al-Malhamatu Al-Kubra. The Prophet ﷺ called it Al-Malhamatu Al-Kubra. And a lot of the scholars say Al-Mahdi will be leading this. Al-Malhamatu Al-Kubra. The gigantic war, the gigantic combat. He will fight the Romans. Al-Rum. In those days, Al-Rum had a different name to what we have today. It's a bit difficult to pinpoint them, but our scholars tell us point towards the Europeans, Europeans in general. And Ar-Rum, who are the Byzantines then, are today, today the offsprings are mostly the Europeans and their branches. And at the last campaign, the Muslims will come and the other side, its opposition will come to face it. And the opposition is so huge. 80 banners, 80 different flags. Under each flag, 12,000 men. And when the two sides meet and the Muslims see this, a third of them will run away. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah will never accept their repentance ever. Because running away reduces and destroys the morale of everyone standing. So then the campaign starts and the battle is hot in its intense. You will see the flying object or the birds or whatever is flying on the outskirts of this war. It's got nothing to do with the war. It'll drop from the sky. It'll drop. And some scholars look at it and you can probably analyze it as being atomical warfare. Gases that make birds and objects in the sky fall. That is flying on the edges. It's got nothing to do with the war. will drop from the sky. This is the hadith of Prophet And a third of the Muslims will die. And a third will be victorious. 
just a third will be victorious. And they will be there on the battlefield collecting the remnants and the booty of war. And the hadith says, from one tribe, 99 have died and one person is left. So what joy will he have at victory and what joy will he have at collecting booty? So you would think after such a calamity, after such a colossal engagement, or what is referred to in the books that preceded us as Armageddon, you would have expected issues to become more relaxed. Yet, as they have just become victorious and are collecting the things of the battlefield, a voice will come out to them. Someone calls out and says, Go back to your family and your homes quickly, for a Dajjal has appeared. That, O oh Muslims, the Dajjal has come in your lands. And the first of the Alamatul Kubra, the first of the major signs, is the advent of the Dajjal or the Antichrist. A Dajjal means the liar, the impersonator, one who lies about his impersonation, lies about who he represents. So he comes and says that he is Prophet Isa alayhi salam when he first comes out. So the Imam Al Mahdi will send 10 people, 10 riders, to go and investigate and scout, see if the news is correct. And the Rasul says, Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. I know their names, and I know the names of their fathers, and I know the color of their horses. They will be the best riders of the day. So they will go and see, ah, hint. The calamity has come. The Dajjal has come. Who is this Dajjal? The first of the big signs of Qiyamah. And understand, when the signs, the major signs are unleashed, they will follow each other like beads on a necklace. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-ayat ay alamat. The major signs are like beads on a necklace. When the necklace is cut, one will come after the other. So the Dajjal comes. Let's describe him. A Dajjal is a man. He's a man. He's a human being. The Prophet says, Dajjal has one of his eyes obliterated, like as in wiped out. It is covered. مَمْسُوحُ الْعَيْنِ مَكْتُوبٌ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ كَافِرٌ On his forehead is written kafir. And the Prophet ﷺ separated it. كَافَرَ يَقْرَأُهُ كُلُّ مُؤْمِنٍ Every believer can read it, whether he's literate or illiterate. And one eye is wiped out as in it's covered. The second eye is damaged. And the word of the hadith says it has shrunk. And it uses the same word that describes when grapes, you know, shrivel in the sun and become, you know, wrinkly and small. So the, one eye will be covered, the other eye will be like a worn out on old or wrinkly grape. It will be squeezed down. Between his forehead will be written kafir. The Prophet ﷺ described him, his hair will be curly, his legs will be arced, he walks a little different. He's stubby, strongly built, and his start or where he comes out from again will be from the area of Khorasan. So the Prophet described the people that will come with him, and he uses the word 70,000 of the Jews of Isfahan. And describing the faces, it resembles the area between Afghanistan and and Iran, some of the inhabitants there, the Prophet says they will have flat faces like the shield and their cheekbones will be raised and their faces will be meaty and they will be wearing cloaks around them. Do the mats! And his first time that he becomes evident will be in the land of the Arabs. And he will travel, he will roam the earth and the hadith says not a village will be missed except he has gone to it and what kalam and subhanallah listen to the ahadith with regards to him the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says listen there is no calamity on the face of this earth from the time of adam till qiyamah come greater than the calamity of the dajjal and there wasn't a prophet that came and accepted he came and warned his people about him and in another hadith, and Nuh warned his people about him. Nuh, very early in human history, 
At that time, Nuh warned his people about this calamity of the Dajjal. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, All Prophets warned their people about him. وَأَنَا آخِرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And I am the last of the Prophets. And you are the last of the nations. So he will come from you, there's no way about it. He will come amidst your time. لا محالة There is no exception. It will come in your time. And then he says, برحمة المهداء That if he comes, وَأَنَا بَيْنَ أَظْهُرِكُمْ And I am amidst you, then I will suffice him on your behalf. I will fight him on your behalf. If I am here and he comes, leave him to me. But if he comes and I'm not here, then I leave you to Allah and Allah Rabbul Azza will be your caretaker. And in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, From the time of Adam until Qiyamah, no Amr has come greater than that of the Dajjal. You know, Christians and Jews will be among the first to follow him. They'll actually, the Jews will be the first to follow him because they are waiting for their Messiah to come. They don't believe that Isa Alayhi Salam was it. And they don't want to accept Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they'll be the first to follow a Dajjal. They feel, they say, he is the real Isa. As for the Christians, they believe in the coming of Isa Alayhi Salam. Because they've mixed up their scriptures, they will think that this is the man. And because he will say, I am Isa, they will ask for him, alayhi salam, they will ask for miracles and he will do these miracles. Some of them won't be convinced. See, afterwards he'll say that I am God. Ana ilahukum. Non-Muslim people and the weak Muslims will follow him. The Dajjal will shake Iman to its core. And subhanallah, before he comes, three years will happen like this. In the first year, Allah Rabbul Izzah will order the sky to hold back a third of its rain. So a third of the water of the rain will be held back. And the second year, two thirds will be held back. And the third year, there will be no rain. So a drought and famine has already gripped mankind. And then this man comes, the Dajjal. With him, a river of fire and a river of water. And he enters into a village amidst the people. And he says, do you believe in me? I am your Lord. And when they believe, he tells the sky rain and rain comes. Tells the earth, produce your produce and it will produce its produce. He will go to a dead person, tell a person, a Bedouin, if I bring your parents back to life, would you believe that I am your Lord? He will say, yes, he says, rise. And two shayateen will come in the image of his parents and will say, son, listen to him, he's your Lord. Do you see Iman is shaken to its core? How do you not believe your eyes? He will tell the earth, spit out your treasures. The hadith says, like bees, gold and silver and diamonds will come out of the ground and follow him. It's difficult times. At this instance, only Iman will see you through. Listen carefully, Muslims. All the faculties and information gathering tools that you have will be deceived. The only thing that you will have left is your hearts. And it is important and I insist regularly work on the hearts. So in the time of the Dajjal, Iman will be shaken to its core. And he will go to another group of people, believe, they will say no. So he says, sky hold your water, earth hold your produce, and famine and drought and calamity will befall him. It is so easy just to say, khalas, okay, I believe, let's go, bring it on. That is why it is such a colossal test. And there will be one man who will be able to, who will do something. A Rasul Sallallahu says, I know him and he is the best man in, on that day. He will come warning the people saying he is not God. He is not God. He is a Dajjal. He is the Antichrist. And they will say, what are you saying about our Lord? So they'll bring him to him. And he will say, I am your God. Look what I can do. He said, you are the liar. And the Prophet Sallallahu told us about you. So he'll bring a saw and he'll saw him in half. And then he'll walk between the two body parts and the man will come and rise, he'll become alive again. And the Prophet ﷺ told us he'll be able to do that once, just once. And the Dajjal says to him, now do you believe I am God? And he says, now I believe more that you are not God, but you are actually a Dajjal because you cannot do this to me again. And truly, he will not be able to do that again. He will throw him into his fire. And Rasul ﷺ tells us he will have something that looks like a fire and something that looks like water. He said it's an illusion. The fire is his water and his water is his fire. Go to the fire to drink from it if you see it. And the man vanishes, disappears. Rasul says, he is the best, he is a real man, you know, the best of men in that day who tries to call the people away from the worship of a Dajjal. And he will stay and roam the earth for 40 days. The first day will be the length of a year. And look at the Ashab of the Rasul. 
when he said to them, a day like a year, their concern was, it wasn't what time will I wake up and sleep? Do I sleep for six months, O Prophet? They said, what about salah, ya Prophet? How do we pray? If it's, do we pray five times in the whole year? Or, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, اُقْدِرُوا لَهُ قَدْرًا Allocate times for it. Replicate the days. So the first day will be like a year. The second day like a month. The third day like a week. Fourth and onwards will be like ordinary days. He will traverse every city and every village except for two places. Makkah and Medina. Allah Rabbul Azza has protected those with angels. He will come towards Medina behind Uhud. Behind Uhud. And he will climb the hilltop with his people. And he will say, do you see that white palace? That white palace of Ahmed. And subhanallah, you look at the pictures of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From that far and that distance, it looks like a white palace. That is the palace of Ahmed. And he gets down to come towards it and the angel shoes him away. And he turns his face towards Bilad al-Sham. And understand, this is the time of the Mahdi. The Imam is here and the Dajjal has come. And I want to mention the, a story and I'll stick to the English for time reasons. This is the story of Tamim al-Dari. And I will give a general of whom instead of going into it in details. Tamim al-Dari was a Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a Christian who became a Muslim. And he had an amazing experience. Tamim al-Dari came to the Rasul and narrated a story. Ya Rasul Allah, I was in a ship and the ocean started to become rough. And there's 30 other people with me. And the waves, you know, bashed us from pillar to post for a whole month. You know, it's tossing us between waves. And after a month, the waves subsided. And we reached near an island. And we anchored the ship and took a little boat and came to the island. And at the brink of the island, we saw a creature, the strangest we have seen, covered in hair to the extent that we couldn't tell its front from its behind. And they look at him, imagine the poor guys, you know, a month of, of seasickness. And now here, and they see this creature. So they said, woe be unto you, what are you? So he said, I am Jasasa. So they are hesitant and they say, we thought he's like a devil. So Jasasa said, there's a person in that monastery who is longing to see you, go to him. They said, when the beast told us about this man, a man, they said, we ran away from the beast immediately thinking it was a jinn or a shaitan or something and ran to this man, to this human being. We entered this hut that was set for worship and suddenly we saw in front of us a person, a man who was the biggest in build that we have yet to have seen. And he was so coarse in his body and in his features, strong and coarse, and big. His arms were wrapped to his neck with chains and his head and arms were also chained together to his knees to his legs and he's chained up really well he couldn't move legs and arms into his neck we said what are you and he said you are able to hurt me because i'm chained up so it's my right to ask who are you first so i can ensure my safety they said very well we are people from the arabs we rode we set sail in our ship and a storm hit us until we became lost and landed on this island. We came to this island and we found this beast that came to us that had so much hair on it. We asked it, who are you? And it said to us, I am the spire or the passer of news. And it led us to you. They said, we got afraid of this man and we, did, we didn't feel safe around him. However, the man said to us, tell me about the palm trees of Baysan. Baysan is a city in Jordan. And he wanted to know whether there were palm trees planted in there a lot. We said, what do you exactly want to know about Baysan in Jordan? He said, I ask you, are there more palm trees and have they be filled with dates or not yet? They said, yes, it is full of palm trees and full of dates, more than many other places in, in, in what we know. He said, soon its palm trees and dates will become scarce. We no longer give fruits. Today, really, in Jordan, dates are scarce now. It used to be in history, abundance. Now listen. He said, now explain to me about Buhayr al-Tabariya. It's also close to Asham. They said, what do you want to know about it? He said, does it have water in it? He said, they said, yes, there's lots of water. He said, soon its water is going to go away. 
not going to exist anymore. And truly today, the water has gone drier than before. Then he asked them, he said, tell me about Zagar fountain. And Zagar fountain is uh, somewhere near Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis. Probably about three days journey if you wanted to walk away from Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis. That's where that fountain is. So basically in what we call Israel today. They said, what do you want to know about this fountain? He said, well, is there a large fountain happening and a great river from it and do people plant a lot of vegetation around it and it gives a lot of water yet they said yes it's all got a lot of water and it's people plant a lot so then he asks tell me about the unlettered prophet and nabi yul ummi tell me about muhammad has he come and what is his situation yes he has come they said he has come out in mecca and now he lives in yathrib in medina he asked them have his people fought him they said yes he said, what did he do? They said he was driven out by his own people. But he went to another Arab who are the, the, the Yathri people and those who embraced Islam with him and they uh, obeyed him. This man said to them, really? Has that really happened? They said, yes. He said, Ama inna dhaka khayrun lahum an He said, behold, it is better for those people who obey him to keep on obeying him. He's actually supporting the Prophet Now I'm going to tell you about myself. As with regards to me, I am the Dajjal. Soon I will be given permission to come out of here. I will be released. And I will traverse the earth from its corner to its corner, not leaving a city or a village behind. And I will roam it for 40 days, a day like a year and so on and so forth. And I will go to every city except for Mecca and Tayyibah. So the Rasul at this time narrating the story hit his member like this. He goes Tayyibah, Tayyibah, this is Tayyibah, Medina is Tayyibah. فَهُمَا مُحَرَّمَتَانِ عَلَيَّ كِلْتَاهُمَا He said they are both forbidden for me to enter. Now when we say he enters, it means he conquers, takes over, he owns it. كُلَّمَا أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَدْخُلَ وَاحِدِ Because every time I wanted to come into one of them, an angel will stand guard holding a, a sword and he will prevent me from entering Mecca and Medina. He said, and now between the, every two mountains that you can find a pathway entering into, into Mecca and Medina, there are groups of angels standing guarding it right now to the last hour. There are always angels from any, if you're going to enter Mecca or Medina through any pathway through, through mountains, two mountains, there will always be angels within there guarding it, but we cannot see them. Rasul advised us to go there if we can. And if we see him, go in the other direction. We can't fight him. And in another hadith, it describes how he'll, he will be released. Subhanallah, Ibn Umar annoyed a person who they used to consider at the time of the Ashab as he might be the Dajjal. So he says, he came and told the story to Hafsa. Hafsa is his sister and the wife of the Rasul. He says, I got him so angry that I saw him fuming like his body is about to explode. If you know when you go red and you feel like you're expanding. So Hafsa said, woe be unto you, ya Ibn Umar. Don't you know that the Prophet said he will be released due to a moment of anger? As in the Dajjal will become angry somehow and he will rip the chains off Wallahu A'lam and then he will be released. So then he will roam the world until he comes and the Muslims are under the leadership of Imam Al-Mahdi and understand they don't have the capacity to overcome this challenge. So Muslims are constantly on the back foot until they are locked up and surrounded in one narration says Bayt al-Maqdis in one qawl at the base of Jabal al-Tur and the Rajih is Bayt al-Maqdis they are there and they are surrounded and the Dajjal and his army is outside and the siege lasts and as the Muslims are in the siege with the Dajjal and the fear is immense man will tie their wives and their mothers and sisters out of fear that they will run to the Dajjal and fall victim to it even in Medina al munawwara when he is camped outside Medina, three earthquakes will hit the city. Everyone will think, oh my God, and run out of the city. So the Prophet said, Allah will purify the city of its hypocrites. And only the true believers will remain. So now the Dajjal after that comes to Bayt al-Maqdis. And the Imam is there. And the Muslims are there. And they're trying to put up a resistance. And at this juncture, at this point, when they are inside this encampment, Allah Rabbul Izzah sends them their solution. And the solution of the Dajjal is Masih, Isa alayhi salam. So listen to, and I will rush through this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, Isa, the son of Mary, will descend. How will he descend, Ya Rasul? His hand will be on the wings of two angels. He will be covered in two garbs, 
both tinged slightly yellow. بيج محرودتين واضع كفيه على أجنحة ملكين ويا رسول عند منارة بيضاء الشرقية دمشق next to the white minaret at the eastern side of Damascus and سبحان الله at the eastern door of Damascus there is a white minaret and there is the other one of the Umawi mosque both white minarets they didn't exist at the time of the Rasul but now it is there so Isa will come down in that place then he will make his way towards Baytul Maqdis or Jabal al -Tur. and the Ahadith say the Muslims at this stage are thinking what to do so eventually they come to this consensus listen we can't sit here forever let's get out and meet them face to face so they make this decision at night that tomorrow we will open the doors and go and take the sun head on and Fajr comes Fajr comes Salat of Fajr and the Adhan is given and the lines stand up and Iqama is given and then Subhan al Khaliq the day or the area goes dark the area and the hadith says so that a man cannot see his hand it will go dark and then when light comes back they see in Isa is amidst them and the Prophet sallallahu says he will lower his head and you will see like moisture on it as though his hair is wet but it isn't wet and when he lifts it beads roll down his head like liquid like pearls and they scatter and he comes to the Salat of Fajr and the Prophet says what will be your situation when Isa the son of Mary comes amidst you wa imamukum minkum and your Imam is amidst you the Imam is there Isa alayhi salam what will be your situation so listen the Iqama is given and he notices that Isa alayhi salam comes so he says ta'ala salli bina come lead us in Salah so in one qawl the Prophet sallallahu says Isa alayhi salam will put his hand between the shoulders of the Mahdi and say Ba'dukum umara ba'd takramatullahi lihaathihi al-umma This is the honor that Allah Rabbul Izza has given this nation You will lead each other So remain in your position So Isa alayhi salam comes down for a different purpose And he prays behind al-Mahdi That's how important al-Mahdi is And the qawl of the Ahl al-Ilm is And in another narration he says The iqama was given for you So lead the salah And then when the salah is finished and the people are ready. Do you understand? They were ready before Isa now for this challenge. That is why when you reach a level, Allah Rabbul Izzah will give you its solution. So he says, open the doors. So the doors open. And from afar, the Dajjal sees Isa alayhi salam. The false Messiah sees the real Messiah. And the Hadith says he starts to melt like salt and water. Dissolve like salt and water. And he runs and Isa alayhi salam chases him. And calling he says, it is written that I owe you one strike. I owe you one hit and that will come. So he catches him in the Babil Lud in Palestine. And in that place, in one narration with a lance and another one with a sword, Isa alayhi salam will strike and show the blood of the Dajjal in his sword. And the Hadith says, had he were not to strike, the man would have melted to death. He says to the people, can a God die? Here he is, I've killed him. Because if he melted and vanished, they'll think, oh, God went away. So he kills him to tell them that this is not God. And the Dajjal and the battle with the Dajjal will be finished. And the Muslims have gone through a colossal test. And Isa alayhi salam will come to them and rub their faces out of mercy and kindness and give them the bushara. This is your place in Jannah. This is your place in Jannah. And as this calamity of the Dajjal has just finished, Allah Rabbul Izzah will inspire Isa alayhi salam that, O oh Isa, another of my creatures is about to come out and no power on the face of this earth will withstand them and outstand them. And Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, those two tribes or nations are also being mentioned in the Bible and the Old Testament. So we share the same knowledge, maybe in some differences and understanding of it with the Jews and the Christians. Gog and Magog. Strange wordings. There are actually two words. Ya'juj is one and Ma'juj is another. And, in, and when you say it in Arabic, for an Arab who listens to that word, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, it's a very harsh and you know, coarse word. It comes from the root word of Ujaj to be dry, to be dry and to be harsh. And it also comes from the meaning Al-Aj, meaning when the enemy comes really fast, close to you really fast, comes, attacks you really quickly. 
So these Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are dry and harsh in nature. And when they come out, they're going to come out so quickly and so fast, you will not be able to stand in front of them. You have to run away from them. That's what the scholars tell us about these meanings. And Gog and Magog are two nations from the progeny and the offsprings of Adam. So they are human beings. They're not these big beasts and monsters as we grew up thinking. They are these two gigantic people with one eye and so on. And they are so big in their multitude. They are so humongous in their numbers. That the Prophet والسلام, says in one hadith that once one of them dies, leaves behind 1,000 of his offspring. So you could imagine the number of these people. Another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he says that Ya'juj wa Ma'juj are 400,000 nations. So there are two nations divided into 400,000 nations. And he says, alayhi salatu wasalam, each time one of them dies, leaves behind an offspring of over 1,000 men carrying the sword. That's how dangerous they are. That's how corrupt they are. And that's how fearful they are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of them in the Quran al-Kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to that in Surah Al-Kahf, the story of Dhul Qarnayn, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ O Muhammad, they ask you about Dhul Qarnayn. And Dhul Qarnayn means the one with the two horns. He was called that name because he used to wear a hat that had two horns coming out of it. Then Allah Azza wa Jal continues and he says, قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا Well, I shall tell you more about Dhul Qarnayn and the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Dhul Qarnayn was a righteous, just ruler. He is not a prophet, nor that he is a messenger. He is a righteous ruler, a righteous, just leader. Dhul Qarnayn was an extremely powerful king, and he was a worshipper of Allah, a righteous, just Muslim king, among the best that ever existed on earth. He was a Muslim before the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as all prophets and messengers came with one religion, one call and that's the submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the commands of Allah. Dhul Qarnayn was a Muslim, a righteous, just ruler that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him strong establishment and power and strength on the surface of this earth in which Allah azza wa says inna makkanna lahu fil ard we had established him Firmly established him upon this earth. Firmly established him and strongly established him on the service of this earth. وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا So not only we strengthened him and not only we established him, but then Allah Azza wa Jalla says, and we gave him a way and means of everything. So Allah Azza wa Jalla established him strongly on the service of this earth and Allah gave him power. Allah gave him authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him strength. فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا Allah Azza wa says and he followed away. He continued obeying Allah Azza wa Jal and establishing the commands of Allah on the service of this earth. Then Allah tells us about his journey on the service of this earth. حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ مَغْرِبَ الشَّمْسِ وَجَدَهَا تَغْرُبُ فِي عَيْنٍ حَمِئَةٍ وَوَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا قَوْمًا Until he went towards where the sun sets. So his journey went towards the west, then the east, then he had his first encounter with the tribe and the nation of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So he went towards where the sun sets and Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about Dhul Qarnayn, his attitude and approach and his principle of his leadership, his principle of leading and ruling. Allah Azza wa says, قَالَ أَمَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُهُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ عَذَابًا نُكْرًا Those who, are, who transgress against themselves, those who do wrong, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to Dhul Qarnayn, he says that we will punish them, penalize them in this world, and then we'll leave them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue punishing them a severe punishment. وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُ جَزَاءً الْحُسْنَى But those who do good, those who uphold goodness, those who do righteousness, Dhul Qarnayn says, then we will reward them. We'll give them retribution. We'll give them reward. And we shall speak to them and say to them goodness. After he went towards the west, he moved on and went towards the east. Allah Azza wa speaks about this journey. 
مطلع الشمس وجدها تطلع على قوم لم نجد لهم من دونها سترة until he reached all where the sun rises from he reached all the way to the east where the sun rises from he had an encounter he encountered and met people that they had no cover from the sun and some of the scholars say they were naked so they used to operate at night and sleep during the day because they had no clothing or garments Allah Azza wa Jal continues to say كَذَلِكَ وَقَدْ أَحَطْنَا بِمَا لَدَيْهِ خُبْرًا We had encompassed him with more knowledge that's the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's sending and revealing upon Dhul Qarnayn then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ بَيْنَ السَّدَّيْنِ وَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمَا قَوْمًا لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا After he went to the west and then he went to the east he went just not far away from the east in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says until he reached the what's between the two mountains so there were a range of mountains and there was a gap there was a gap in between the range of mountains he met with people that he could not communicate well with as Allah says in the Quran Kareem قَوْمًا لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا they don't understand any speech so he had an interpreter to interpret with them قَالُوا يَا ذَا الْقَرْنَيْنِ they complained to the Qarnayn and they complained to him about Ya'juj and Ma'juj those two nations those two big corrupt nations and they said إِنَّ يَجُوجَ وَمَأْجُوجَ مُفْسِدِونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Ya'juj and Ma'juj are causing so much mischief and corruption on the surface of this earth they eat anything they want they take anything they want they kill whomever they want فَهَلْ نَجْعَلُ لَكَ خَرْجًا عَلَىٰ أَنْ تَجْعَلَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ سَدَّىٰ So they made a proposal to Dhul Qarnayn. They said, O Dhul Qarnayn, we are making an offer to you that you help us to block them, put them inside that mountain and get rid of their mischief and their corruption. So Dhul Qarnayn, this righteous and pious leader, he says, قَالَ مَا مَكَّنِّ فِيهِ رَبِّي خَيْرٍ وَأَلَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ had bestowed upon me from strength, power and authority is better than what you are trying to offer me. It's better than what you are trying to give me. فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةً أَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ رَدْمًا What I need from you in return, that you assist me and help me in creating a barrier, in creating a wall, a dam, that we could block them inside the mountains and then we could get rid of their corruption and mischief. آتوني زبر الحديد So he put a strategy together. How is he going to get rid of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, and block them inside the mountain? So his strategy was that he gets an iron, plates of iron, and he puts them over each other. So the first thing he did, he pushed them inside the mountains, and then he got plates of iron, and he put them over each other. And some of the scholars said that he put wood in between each plate. So he burnt it, and then he made it melt over one another until it became a strong wall. After that, he did not just stop at creating this iron wall. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, حَتَّى إِذَا جَعَلَهُ نَارًا قَالَ آتُونِي أُفْرِقْ عَلَيْهِ قِطْرًا After this wall of iron, of metal, became so strong, so stiff, so consolidated, he consolidated it with copper, with melted copper that he melted it over the iron. So he had iron, then at the top of the iron he put melted copper, and then he made it a very powerful withstanding wall that blocked the people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, from climbing from above it or penetrating through it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَمَا اسْطَاعُوا أَنْ يَظْهَرُوهُ وَمَا اسْتَطَاعُوا لَهُ نَقْبَةً They could not go over it, nor they could peace, or nor they could penetrate through it. First of all, the Ajuz and Ajuz are unable to get out of there. Number one, there are many reasons why. Number one, as we said before, they are a very primitive people. Their understanding of technology is not like ours. They don't know what's going on in the world right now. They don't, they don't have computers, they don't have airplanes, they don't have these weaponry we have. They have nothing. Remember the people who say, who said to, to Madhul Qarnayn, please protect us from them. And they were primitive themselves. Well, the Ajuz and are even more primitive than them. So they don't have the idea of technology of how to you know, break through this wall. And they are between mountains. These mountains are covered with such bad climate that if they try to go up these mountains, they'll die. So they can't go around or on top of this wall. Some people said this wall is the Great Wall of China. No, it's not the Great Wall of China. Well, the Great Wall of China is broken. You can easily pass through it and on top of it, it's a tourist um, you know, site. The Ajuj and Ajuj are not behind the Wall of China, nor are they the Chinese people. A lot of people, they say, oh, they're the Chinese people. And some people, they describe them as being short. They're like midgets walking around. Oh, and they've got these strange eyes and about if uh, this is all rubbish you know there's nothing in the hadith that states that they are like that and where is that wall and where is that mountain we don't know where it is 
No one knows except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Dhul Qarnayn looked at the people, they looked at this wall and they said, wow, this is a very strong wall. And Dhul Qarnayn wanted to teach them a lesson. Finally, he said, Qala hadha rahmatun min Rabbi. He said, this is from the mercy of my Lord. What's the mercy here? That he allowed us to prevent you from the corruption of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But then, but then, Allah Azza wa Jalla clearly states in the Quran al-Kareem, until the command of Allah and the promise of Allah comes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy that wall and then Ya'juj or Ma'juj will come out to people once again. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, وَيْلٌ لِلْعَرَبْ مِنْ شَرٍ قَدْ اقْتَرَبْ Woe unto the Arabs, the day of judgment is coming near and there is a hole that's been created in the wall and the dam of Ya'juj or Ma'juj and it's only a matter of time where Ya'juj or Ma'juj will penetrate through that dam and wall and they come out to people. Then Zainab radiallahu anha said, Ya Rasulallah, afanahliku wa fina salihun. He said, will we be destroyed? And among us there are still righteous people. Yani, when he said Ya'juj and Ma'juj, it's basically saying that the end of the world has come very near. Allah is going to destroy the world. So the Zainab radiallahu anha says, Ya Rasulallah, are we going to be destroyed so, so soon? And still among us there are righteous people. There's you, there's the Sahabas, there's all these righteous people whom Allah praised in the Quran. Qala na'am. He said, actually, yes, you can be destroyed while righteous people are among you. He said, إِذَا كَثُرَ الْخَبَثِ He said, if the righteous people will be destroyed among the non-righteous people, if, on one condition, when indecency and immorality spread too much. It's too much of it, Allah will destroy the people, including the righteous people among them. There are two definitions to this or interpretations. Number one, either because the righteous people are not doing their job or the corruption has exceeded so much that the righteous people cannot do anymore. So it's time to take them away. The test of the world is pointless. Take them, start judging them, put whoever's in heaven and whoever goes to hell, hellfire. Pointless now to live on. That moment will come in which from the time of the Qarnayn till our day, from the time of the Qurnayn till our days now, they've been trying to penetrate and piece through the wall, piece through the dam. And every single day, they try and dig through the dam, dig through the wall, until they start seeing the ray and the sunbeam coming through these small holes they've been digging through. And then they'll say to themselves, let's go and rest. Let's go and rest and come back the following day and start digging through that wall. So they'll go and rest. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the wall go back as strong as it used to be before they start digging into it. Then they'll come again and they'll start digging through the wall and digging through the dam until they start seeing the sunbeam. And then they'll say, let's come the following day and continue digging. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the wall go back the way it was before they were digging. Until that day they will dig and dig and dig until they see the ray of the sun and see the sunbeam and then they'll say let's come back tomorrow inshallah by the will of Allah and continue digging at that moment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep it the way they left it and then they'll dig and dig and then they'll penetrate through it this is the hadith of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ Until that moment comes, which is that moment before the day of judgment, Allah refers to and He says فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ And the dam in which يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ Gog and Magog are blocked in, it will be penetrated, it will collapse and then يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ They'll swarm out on earth, they'll come out from every corner. The Prophet ﷺ, he says that when يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ come out, they'll take over the entire earth, they'll dominate the entire earth. And when they come out, they just destroy. They destroy, rob, rape, kill, murder, all of these things. They'll come out after Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, the son of Maryam, the son of Mary, after he kills and destroys Antichrist. That moment Allah will inform Isa and the believers and the Muslims surrounding him that I had sent out a nation in which Allah is referring to Ya'juj or Ma'juj. No one can withstand against them. No one can face them. No one can fight them. And Allah will reveal to Isa to go to the Tur, to a mountain nearby Jerusalem, where Isa alayhi salam and 
and the believers will resort to the mountain of Tur and stay at the mountain of Tur awaiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. At that moment, as I mentioned to you before, Ya'juj wa Ma'juj will flock and swarm the entire earth. They'll be in large numbers. They'll destroy everything in front of them. They'll eat anything they want. They'll kill whoever they want until they reach to the lake of Galilee, the lake of Tabariya in Palestine. They'll drink it all. They'll drink the entire lake. This lake is enough for four or five nations at this current moment. By Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, they'll drink the entire water in that lake and leave nothing for those who come after them. That the last, or those who come later on from Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, they'll come to that lake and say, wasn't there water in that lake? They've drank it all. And then they'll destroy anyone on the surface of this earth. The only ones that will survive is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus the son of Maryam, Mary and his followers in which they'll resort and in which they will hide on the top of the mountain of Tur. Yajuj and Ma'juj, there's another hadith that says when they come out, they will fight the people of the, anyone in front, they'll kill them. So there will be non-Muslims that they'll be hiding. They won't kill everyone. Yajuj and Ma'juj will start having this pride. We've dominated what's on earth. We've taken control of what's on earth. Now, let's dominate what's in the heavens. So they start shooting with their arrows up in the air. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make their arrows come back stained with blood. So when they see the, when they see the blood on their arrows, they see stains of blood on the arrows, they'll say, we have dominated what's on earth and we've taken control of what's in the heavens. Allahu Akbar. Isa alayhi salam, along with the believers on the mountain of Tur, hiding there and resorting there, trying to protect themselves from the evilness and the corruption of Ya'juj or Ma'juj. They'll be listening to the sounds and the noises of Ya'juj or Ma'juj. They're so corrupt, they're so loud, they're so evil. They're so evil. While Isa alayhi salam and the believers on the mountain of Tur, they'll be struggling to eat anything. Then the Prophet alayhi salatu he says, a head of an ox, a head of a buffalo or a bull will be worth hundreds of dinars. These days people chuck it, dispose it. They would not even make any use of it. But at that time, because of that moment and predicament that Isa alayhi salam and the believers will endure and face, they'll be on the peak of the mountain of Tur and they have nothing to eat. They'll be struggling. They'll be suffering. فَيَرْغَبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عِيسَى وَأَصْحَابَهِ Then Isa alayhi salam and his companions will start supplicating to Allah. They'll make dua to Allah because they'll be in such a hard time. Until that moment where Isa and the believers will stop hearing noises. They'll stop hearing sounds. And one one stage all that he sounds sounds of war sounds of people screaming and then suddenly there's no sound there's no voices so Isa alayhi salam will ask one of the believers around him to nominate himself and volunteer to come down from the mountain and to check up to see what's happening to see what it's what's exactly happening on earth so one of those youngsters who follows Isa alayhi salam and he will be with Isa at that time he'll nominate himself and say I'll go down knowing that he's gonna go down never come back again so he'll go down and then subhanallah all he sees that Allah had destroyed Ya'juj wa Ma'juj Allah destroys the entire nation of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj and how does Allah azza wa jal destroy this powerful strong nation with one of his smallest and insignificant and tiny creations Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send upon Ya'juj wa Ma'juj worms. Little worms that if you see it, you'll step on it. Allah will send upon Ya'juj wa Ma'juj little worms. They will go to their necks and destroy them. Kill them all. And this is the amazing thing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the power of Allah. Allah will destroy this powerful nation with a very, very tiny, small nation and that's the worms. When he comes down and he sees the entire nation, that nation that dominated and that nation that controlled earth, the entire nation is dead. All he sees is the corpses. All he sees is the corpses of Ya'juj or Ma'juj on the ground. So he goes back to the mountain calling upon the believers and Isa Allahu Akbar Allah had destroyed Ya'juj and Ma'juj so Isa alayhi salam and the believers will come down from the mountain to experience and witness the entire nation of Ya'juj and Ma'juj have been destroyed and all they could see is the deceased and dead corpses of Ya'juj and Ma'juj on the surface of this earth that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he says there will be not even one hand span empty without being contaminated by the corpses and the dirt 
of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj and their bodies. So at that moment, Isa looks, Allahu Akbar, Allah destroyed Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. But whereabouts are we going to live? Where are we going to live on? The entire world is filled up with their corpses and their contamination. So Isa alayhi salam will raise his hands to Allah and say, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, we thank you for destroying Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. But oh Allah, we ask you that you get rid of their contamination. We ask you that you get rid of their dead bodies. So at that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam describes to us, Allah will send birds. Their necks are as long as the necks of the camels. They will come and take the corpses and the dead bodies of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj and they will be thrown away and casted in a place that Allah knows better. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down the rain in which Allah azza wa jal will clean and purify the entire earth that the land and the surface of this earth will become so clean, so pure, as clear and bright as a mirror. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will clean the entire earth and Allah azza wa jal will purify the entire earth from the dirt and the contamination of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. Then Allah azza wa jal will command the ground to plant its crops and plant its vegetables and plant its fruits. Then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he says, glad tidings, glad tidings to those who live during the time of Isa, the son of Maryam. Glad tidings to them. It's a moment of blessing in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless that time and era and it will be a time that Allah azza wa jal will bless the land and will bless the plants and that time that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says that one pomegranate will be enough for over 12 people that one fruit will be enough for a clan of people he says alayhi salatu wa salam a dairy cow will be enough to feed a tribe a dairy cow will be enough to feed hundreds of people. That's the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will bless the time of Isa alayhi salam. And then he says alayhi salatu wa salam, after the destroying of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, after Gog and Magog are destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Muslims at that time will perform Hazz and Umrah and visit Mecca and Medina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to allow his rituals to be upheld by the believers and the Muslims at that time. And Muslims will visit with the leadership of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus the son of Mary, who will lead a congregation and a delegation of Muslims to visit the house of Allah azza wa jal, the Kaaba. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he says, by Allah, I could see the son of Maryam, Isa, coming through this road to visit the house of Allah, making talbiya, labbaik Allahumma says, as if I could see him coming from this path. He even sallallahu alayhi wa sallam precisely tells us which path, which route that Isa alayhi salam will come through to visit the house of Allah in Mecca, the Kaaba. And he'll be making talbiya along the side with the believers and they'll perform hajj or umrah. Isa alayhi salam lives on earth. Well, during his whole lifespan, many hadiths are said about him. But the majority of the hadiths say seven years. Some hadiths say 40 years. We don't know which ones are the most authentic. But according to our majority of our scholars, seven years is what they rest on. After that, there will be khusufat. Now, this is another major sign. There will be swallowings of earths, swallowings. There will be major continent. Well, maybe not continents, but large lands that will actually disappear under the earth. They'll be gone either into the water or they'll be destroyed head over heels. There'll only be dirt left. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us in the hadiths, سَيَكُونُ بَعْدِي خَسْفٌ بِالْمَشْرِقِ After me, after the Prophet's death, there will be a swallowing of earth in somewhere in the eastern region, eastern to Medina. وَخَسْفٌ بِالْمَغْرِبِ And in the west of Medina, somewhere there. وَخَسْفٌ فِي جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ And there will be also a swallowing of the earth in the lands of the Arab, the Arab Peninsula. So Allahu A'lam what will happen in that time. And there will be righteous people also go in those landslides. If you like, there'll be righteous people, but that's because, listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, One companion said, Ya Rasulullah, the earth will swallow the people even if among them there are righteous people. He said, Yes, if its people start to do too much immorality and indecency and all of those things. And we have that today. You can see it a lot in the eastern regions, you can see it a lot in the west. You know, homosexuality and prostitution and all those other khabath. People no longer believe in God and so on and so forth. Then there will be smoke. Smoke will come and it will fill the whole sky. This is another major sign. Allah said in the Quran, Allah 
which means wait until the day comes when the sky will be filled of clear smoke. Everybody in the world will see it. Mubin. Everywhere. يغشى الناس هذا عذاب أليم. يغشى الناس meaning the smoke will cover all the people. يغشىهم أجمعين. It will cover all the people of the earth, and people will say, or Allah says, هذا عذاب أليم. This will be a day of torment. الله أعلم what kind of a torment or a day that would be. Also among the major signs before the end of the world would be the rising of the sun from where it sets. That day, no more repentance will be accepted by anybody, as we said. And finally, there will be something called a dab, the beast. It will come out of the earth. Allah knows what it looks like. الناس, it will speak to the people that you have disobeyed your Lord. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command. Allah azza wa jal will command a nice breeze, a nice breeze wind that will go under the arms of the believers. They will take their souls. It will take their souls so softly and smoothly where the believers will all die and the service of this earth will be left for the disbelievers, for the corrupt people upon them. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the day of judgment will emerge. The only thing after that left is sur, the blowing into the trumpet. Yeah, George, I'm out, George, my brothers and my sisters. It's not a fairy tale story to be told for us to entertain ourselves with. It's a reality and everything with relation to the day of judgment and the major signs of the day of judgment, whether to be Antichrist or the return of Isa alayhi salam or the beast or the sun rising from the west or the rest of the signs of the day of judgment. They're not something for us just to listen to and say to ourselves, wow, that was a very nice story. I really enjoyed it. What have you prepared for that moment? Why have you prepared for that moment? Because let me be clear about it, that if you want to prepare yourself during that moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the major signs to take place, I'm sorry to say to you, but it's too late. It's way too late. You can't study on the gates or the doors or the entrance of the exam and say, now I'm going to study my chemistry or, by, or study my English or study my maths. You need to be well prepared, well versed before you enter the exam and before the exam arrives. What will really help you at that time is your Iman. And your Iman is not something that you could gain or collect or purchase within one day and night. It's something that you need to prepare yourself from now. And at the same time, on another token, speaking about the Day of Judgment, some of us sometimes fall into the trap of the Shaytan in which we become so despondent. We become so despondent. This hopelessness that we start having that Allah Azza wa Jal will not change this world until Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Al-Mahdi or until Allah Azza wa Jal sends Isa alayhi salam. Sometimes we become so despondent, sometimes we become so despaired that we say to ourselves, there is no hope in this ummah, there is no hope in this world until Isa alayhi salam comes or until the Mahdi comes. You are wrong. This is from the shaitan. You should aim and try and achieve the best that you could achieve in this world. Because if you're going to wait for the Mahdi to come, people in the past for the last 1,000 years, they've been waiting for the Mahdi to come and Mahdi hasn't even came yet. So don't wait for the Mahdi to come. And don't wait for the Day of Judgment to come. And don't wait for the major signs of the Day of Judgment to emerge and occur. As a Muslim, I must live my day-to-day -day life and live in this world as if I'm living in this world forever and at the same time live my hereafter as if I'm dying tomorrow. This is the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have in our life and the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.